children. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So we are in the very beginning of chapter eight of uh, the book of Shmuel Bet. Um, and uh, we just uh, finished a, a full chapter of uh, amazing promises and amazing uh, prophecy that solidified David as, uh, as our king forever, essentially. David Melech Israel Chai Kayam, that's where it's from, the eternity of the house of David, um, and the uh, total and full support uh, that God have and faith that God have in, 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 da in David and the dynasty. Yes, he told him that, you know, uh, you and your, sh your children should, uh, you know, keep up the good work. And if you don't, uh, it's not going to be good. Um, but he's never going to, uh, God is never going to uh, replace the house of David. That is where we ended. The next chapter, chapter 8, is the chapter of the big wars. David, in his lifetime, fought 18 wars. Uh, in, 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 his, his, in his lifetime as a, as, a, uh, as a king. Before that he had others, but the main, the, 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 during the, the 40 years of him being a king, he fought 18 wars. Six of them are mentioned in our chapter, and those are the big ones. The big ones because um, the, 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 the quantity of, of, of uh, soldiers that were involved, the amount of casualties that, uh, that they, the, the, the enemy suffered, and we, unfortunately, we also suffered some, some casualties. The uh, vast amount of land that was taken away and the great accomplishment, multiple accomplishments that uh, were accomplished by those wars. Now, just to, um, to sort of set up the stage to understand um, why the wars were waged, because none of those wars were a defense war. None of them. They were all attacked uh, we we attacked first. We David attacked, uh, and and, and uh, he did it for several reasons. Um, um, he did it for several reasons. Um, reason number one is because he was just told this the the the, the, the prophecy that we just listened to that we just had in, in the previous chapter, um, was a, 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 the prophecy that was started because David HaMelech decided that he wants to build the Beit HaMikdash. And he was told clearly that it's not for him. He is not going to be the one. His, uh, his son is going to do it. We discussed the, the, the reason behind, reasons behind it. But David HaMelech was a very unique and uncommon politician. Have you ever seen a politician nowadays that is teeing off the next administration, that his entire time in office, or majority of his time in office, is basically setting up the next generation, uh, even if it's his son, you know? Um, and uh, the point is that uh, nowadays, for sure, nobody is doing that. And... Um, uh, at the time, the, David Amelech, that's only, the only thing he was busy with. Because he was told that he is not the one to build the Beta Mikdash, he wanted to make 100% sure that other than just like shovel ready, like they used to call it in, you know, at the one point after the, two, the 2008, uh, you know, uh, uh, depression, uh, shovel ready uh, uh, project. He wanted to be a shovel-ready project for, for Bet HaMikdash, to build Bet HaMikdash. And therefore, as soon as he is off, uh, you know, off the ticket, uh, when he passed away, basically, his son is going to have everything he needed to build Bet HaMikdash. And that included, which we'll see later, it included uh, blueprints. He prepared the blueprints. 
It included selecting the spot. He found exactly the spot that God would um, <clears throat> selected uh, and revealed to him that uh, that's the spot or the, the, the Bet HaMikdash is supposed to be on. So he selected the spot. And mainly, um, he prepared all the material. Um, it's, you know, how many times we see that projects are delayed because of funding, because of uh, money, plain old. Uh, and and um, he wanted to make sure that everything that's needed, all of the wood and all of the metal, all kinds of metal, silver, gold, copper, whatever is needed, um, and, and all, everything uh, is ready and, and, and uh, you know, basically ready to build. So in order to do that, one of the things that he very quickly realized is that in order to build an edifice, in order to build a proper uh, home for God, this needs to be not just a, a uh, Jewish resources. This needs to be a whole lot of other resources. And he went uh, fishing, uh, so to speak. He went to, to get other resources from the surrounding nations. Um, now, those resources, a lot of them were Jewish money that was taken away in the past 400 years in wars. All of our great neighbors in the, you know, in the neighborhood of the Middle East um, were accustomed to, uh, uh, to step on our heads, uh, when, you know, each one in their own uh, turn. Um, so it'll be the, the Midianites, the Aramites, the, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the, the Amoavites, the, the Philistines, the, the Amorites, all of them. They all at one point or another, um, you know, had wars with us and, and took some stuff from us. Um, some of the stuff we were able to get back, some not. But the bottom line is that there was a lot of money around and a lot of resources around. The Middle East in, in, in those days was the more, one of the most productive in terms of technology, in terms of advancement, in terms of it was a very uh, a central uh, a trade route um, between the three continents. So there was a lot of money there. And David Amelech decided that, um, you know, that's one of the things that he needed to, to do is to uh, consolidate and to gather as much as possible to be ready to build Beit HaMikdash. That's number one. Number two, um, <clears throat> David HaMelech saw, was, was, uh, saw that a lot of those nations um, are becoming uh, strong. Uh, they're becoming strong and they're becoming wealthy. And with that comes the appetite, you know, ask the Chinese today. Um, they they uh, they want more. They want more, and they 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 always eyed the the crown jewel, which is uh, you know our land. Um, and uh, in order to make sure that they don't have any wrong ideas, deterrent. Uh, he created strong deterrent by uh, waging war with each and every one of those you know up and coming uh, nations. To make sure that they don't have any wrong ideas, and um, and indeed he was able to accomplish it to a new extent. Um, his son Shmu Shlomo was a, a king for forty years, and during those forty years, there was there were no uh, uh, you know no wars. There was not. The, it was the, the best forty years of, of the Jewish people ever. Everybody you know was peace in the land. Wealth, we did everything, you know, everything was good. And it was for the most part, for, for a large uh, reason, because of the deterrent that uh, David HaMelech created in those, in those f six wars that we're going to discuss uh, uh, right, you know, today. Now, a lot of those nations also, because they saw that we are the Adaks, they were all idol worshippers, and we were not. So they were all exchanging, you know, Show me your God, I'll show you mine. You know, uh, that kind of they, they were they were from the same. They, they were the theology was very similar. It's just uh, different methods and different uh, shapes of gods, but it's all was the same idea, paganism. Um, and we were different, and as such, they created a lot of alliances among themselves. And we'll see when we attack one uh, country, another country, another another nation came to their aid. And then we needed to fight another nation. 
And then, you know, in an, <laughs> this story happened several times where a couple of nations ganged up on us uh, and, and tried to fend off uh, the attacks that David the Melech uh, created. Now, so that's the second reason, the deterrent. So to gather the wealth for the Bet HaMikdash and the deterrent, that's number two. Number three, a lot of those nations were walking around with the equivalent of an Oslo court that we signed with them or one of our ancestors signed with them. There was an accord that was signed by, guess who, Abraham. Uh, Abraham Accord. Um, and, and that was with the, Yevus, the, the, the the Philistines, the Avimelech, who later on became the people of, the, the, of Yevus. Uh, and that is the first thing that uh, David Amelech tore. Um, those are the people that were sitting in Yerushalayim. And, um, and he, uh, he needed to... Uh, to straighten that that treaty, um, all of those treaties were torn apart um, because the other side did not keep their did not you know they, they violated and they didn't keep uh, their end of the deal several times over in the past four hundred years, um, and we are like you know that's the way we are sometimes. We always kept, you know, you sign the deal, so you keep the deal. It doesn't matter that the other side, you know. So, but David Amelech did not buy, did not buy it, and he's the first one that says, you know, all of those people who violated the deals with us, we don't have any more deal. And those deals were uh, cemented, or were held together with a um, uh, some sort of a a. a contract or a testimony of a, of, a, of a physical item and in each and every one of them David HaMelech made sure to take this item out to, to tear the contract to tear the, the inanimate object that was the, the witness for it like the, the monument for, for, the, for this uh, uh, for the agreement so in Yerushalayim we know that there, they had those um, uh those those statues in the in the entry to the to the city he took tore them apart um and they were so that's the one with the Abraham which we learned a couple of chapters ago now there are two other covenants one of them is with Abraham's son Isaac and another one with his son Yaakov Jacob so all of those um, <laughs> all of all of our ancestors signed deals and none of the enemies uh, who we signed the deal with, you know, we always say that uh, nowadays you say you have to make peace with an enemy. Of course, but the enemy has to be ready to become a friend. When the enemy signs a deal and stays an enemy, it doesn't, it's not worth what, you know, the, the, the paper they're signing. Um, so, and David Melech really uh, basically uh, exercised our right to uh, um, reciprocity, like Netanyahu likes to say, right? So, um, and they didn't keep their part of the deal, so the, so the deal is off, and he needed to make sure that they all know it, that there are no monkey business anymore, no jokes here. So, the very first thing that he did is after taking Yerushalayim, which is the Yevusites, we were connected to the Philistines um, in, in uh, many ways, um, and, and they were their ancestors. He went after the Philistines themselves, even though the Philistines were quiet already, because they were the, the arch enemy that most recently attacked us several times, three, four times. Um, and they were, and they were not, and they were quiet at this point. But David Amalek just wanted to just finish them off and, and remove the threat forever and take whatever, you know, with the, the wealth that they, they, they have. In order to uh, for, for better mikdash and to make sure that they know that there are no deals, we we, we don't have any peace agreement here. Vayach echen, vayach David et plishtim, vayach niem. So he he hit, he smite them, he stroked them, he attacked them, and he subdued them. Okay, vayikach David et metega amam yat plishtim, and he took. What did he take? He took the uh, object that Isaac used to sign a deal with him. Isaac was the son of Abraham, right? And just like Abraham Avinu had a deal with the Philistines, Isaac felt that he's going to renew that deal and sort of sign it again 
Um, so the signature that he signed was with some sort of an object that was, you know, uh, uh, he used to uh, restrain a donkey, whatever it was. But the bottom line is that object had to be taken away because they were waving it. Hey, we have a deal, you know, we have the, this signed uh, deal. So he had to take it away. And dismantling the process, the capital city, all of their... Um, uh, all of their um, uh, uh, institutions, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court, the, the, the governmental institutions, he had to dismantle them. That's the Metagama. He took it away from them and basically made sure that they are no longer a threat, which they weren't for many, many years um, uh, thereafter. So that is, um, that is what he did, uh, what uh, David Amelech did with the Philistines. That's war number one. War number two, Vayach et Moab. So he went to the Moabites. Now the Moabites, let's just, uh, the Moabites had a, 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 a you know, a long uh, uh, history uh, with our people. Um, not good history. Um, the Moabites didn't let us come into the country, pass their country on the way out of, of, uh, uh, of Egypt. Um, Balak was the one that hired Bilam to curse us, right? That's, that's the Moabites. Uh, the Moabites also were the uh, people uh, from which uh, Ruth came from. Ruth is the grandmother, great-grandmother of David, right? Um, she came from the Moabites. She was actually the daughter of the Moabite king, Eglon. And um, so um, David Amelech in a way, had some Moabite DNA in him. You know, she converted and the whole bit, but he was, you know, it was family, right? A little bit. He felt... Uh... Now, when he ran away, when David Amelech ran away from Saul, um, he felt that the first thing that Saul is going to do, Shaul is going to do, is go after his family. That was the customary thing. You know, they want you back, so they'll take the family. So he took all of his family, his father, his seven brothers, um, the, 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 the mothers over there that were, uh, mother, I think one, um, he took them and he snuck them out of the land of Israel, of Bethlehem, where they were, and he needed to hide them somewhere. Now, it's one thing for David Amelech, who was at the time young, uh, young guy, uh, run around, you know, uh, in the desert with a militia and, 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 you know, try to survive, uh, in caves and stuff. And it's another thing for Ishai, who was an old man at the time, very old man. I mean, the, David Amalek was the youngest of eight, uh, and Ishai was a, an older person at the time. Um, so he was looking for a safe harbor for them. And the first thing that came to mind, that's closed, you know, he didn't have a 777 to take, you know, to fly with some sort of a crooked engine somewhere to, to hide them. So... He um, ended up um, deciding to take them to Moab because Moabites, uh, that's my, you know, grand, grand, you know, great grandparents over there, uh, great grandparents. So maybe, uh, maybe they'll be nice to us and, uh, and, and let us stay uh, until the situation with Shaul is, is, is clear. He took him there and those Moabites found, uh, you know, uh, like, uh, 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 found a very good uh, use for those people, and that is to kill them and to uh, to torture them and kill them. Um, they were very upset at Ruth, who was their queen, for making the what's called the Moab exit. Moab exit, you know, they she basically left the royal family over there, and she decided to convert to Judaism, and you know, so they did not see that uh, favorably. And they felt that this was a slap uh, on their faces. And uh, so they retaliated, you know, uh, that's what Ruth did. So we'll take her grandchildren and we'll kill them. It's the, you know, that's a natural thing to do, right? Um, so David Amelech had, uh, is, uh, now there are those who say that they killed him while David was watching. Some say not, some say yes, but whatever, for whatever, whichever way it happened, it was gruesome, it was terrible. And David Amelech did not forget. It happened many years before that. It's, it happened basically about 10 years before where we are right now. But David Amelech had a long memory and he would not uh, let that go. Now, the, um, 
it, it, we know, uh, by the way, that there was a um, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, the, the, the last war that Moshe Rabbeinu had to fight was with the Midianites. The Midianites produced, um, sent their uh, uh, princes to have a relationship in our camp with one of our Nesi'im, our presidents of the heads of the tribes, um, and Pinchas killed them both, if you recall that story, right? Um, and um, so the Midianites really had a, um, and, they, and they're far, you know, they, they live far down, you know, close to Saudi Arabia. They didn't have border with us. We were not, we were not uh, close to them. They made sure to come and, and, and pick a fight with us. So uh, God had, uh, you know, a history with them and, and, and a need to, to get rid of them, to, to retaliate. So he sent Moshe Rabbeinu, he says, before you die, the last thing you do is you have to retaliate um, and, and fight my war with the Midianites. Now, the problem is that uh, who is uh, uh, Moshe's uh, bra- father-in-law? Jethro, Yitro, right? He's a Midianite. So... Uh, Moshe's wife is a Midianite, uh, and she. Uh, so, so now Moshe has to go and and really fight against the nation that saved him because Yitro saved him when he ran away from Egypt. Right, he brought him in, uh, he took care of him, and he gave him his daughter. So Moshe Rabbeinu did not fight the war himself. He was told to fight the war. Uh, but he took a proxy to do it because he didn't want to uh, throw a stone to the well that he drank from. Um, and, and rightfully so, Akaratatov, you know, you have to appreciate the, 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 the good that, that people uh, do to you. So he uh, made sure he selected the soldiers, he assigned the Pinchas to lead the war, and, but he himself did not really go to the war. Because of, of Hakaratatov, because of appreciation uh, for what they did. And we're told also, because the, even though the Egyptians were not nice to us when we were in, you know, in exile over there, because they hosted us for 200 years, we have to be nice to them to a certain extent. There are some laws in Halakha. Now, the problem is, is why is um, David Amelech um, not doing the same thing? I mean, he's coming from the Moabites. Why doesn't he have Hakaratatov to the Moabites? So the answer is, is because what we just discussed. They killed his father. They killed his mother. They killed his, his brothers and uh, probably a bunch of sisters. He, they killed them all. So there is absolutely no Hakaratatov and there is no way it's, it's he actually obligated to uh, retaliate. So, and he does it in the most gruesome and the most vicious way because he needed them to understand that what they did is so unacceptable and they're going to, he gave them a taste of their own medicine. Because he knew their ways, because he has, so to speak, their DNA, it's the, he knew how to get to them. He knew what's important to them. He knew how to... Um, uh, humiliate them best, best of them all. I mean, we know from our history that the people who caused us, you know, uh, uh, the Jewish people most trouble are people that came from, you know, or, or former or whatever, converted Jews. They caused us um, all these years, all, all, all the decades uh, in exile, most trouble. So Lehavdil here is the same, the same way. So what does he do? So Vayachet Moab, so he attacks them, he defeats them. And then he takes all of the Moabites and he put them on the floor in a in the line. He makes them first of all. You all hit the dirt, and humiliate them in that way. He makes them lie down, and then the And then he is measuring them. It says hevel is a rope, but it's also a lot, a lottery. Okay, he is also making a lottery. And hashkevotam arza, he lay them down on the floor. And he took two rope length to uh, kill and one rope length to, to stay alive. Basically, it's a lottery, you know, the, the, the way you, you lie down and, you know, two out, one in, two out, one in. And that's how, in order to really, really totally humiliate them, 
um, and 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 ex- exert uh, the 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 proper revenge now because they killed uh, his family, they killed uh, Ru- they, they 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 were upset about Ruth, etc. Now, why not kill all of them? Because of Ruth, you know, when 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 uh, uh, it says that there are three partners in in every baby, the father, the mother, and God, right? So, from the father's perspective, he's shy. They killed him. They, he needed retaliation. From the God perspective, they were definitely not friends of God ever. They were they were going against, uh, you know, against the people of the lot, right? They were always against us in many many different ways, um, and they were um, they didn't t- they didn't believe that the the, the uh, mazal of God is with us, that the, the eye of God, that the lot of God is with us. So he told him, you know what, let's do a lot for you as well. You know, you do, we, we are the people of the lot, you know, we, we have in Yom Kippur, we have the lottery between the two, uh, the two goats, right? One is, is being sacrificed and another one is being thrown off the cliff. You familiar with that, right? So there is a lot, uh, it's, a, it's a goral. So he did the same thing to them. You don't like the goral of the Jews? Very nice. We're going to make a goral for you, special for you. Um, so we're saying, Yaakov Hevel Nachlato. The, the God is saying that Jacob, Yaakov, are the, the Jewish people are the goral, the lack, Hevel uh, that, That's the, 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 the lack of, 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 of his, uh, um, uh, of his nachala, of his inheritance. Okay? Uh, so Hevel is, is the same word that we're using here. To, to make the lottery uh, to basically kill two thirds of the Moabites. So after he did that, the, uh, the, the remaining third is um, um, continuing to, uh, to, to become our servants. Um, so he uh, basically um, ext- extracted revenge um, from those who died and from those who are alive. They remain our uh, servants, and they basically s- cease to be a, a a factor in the Middle East uh, from that point on. So that's war number two. War number three was um, to eliminate the covenant or the Asla Accord of Jacob. Okay, Jacob also had an accord. He signed a deal with who? With his beloved father-in-law, Lavan, right? He, after uh, he worked for his uh, first wife and his second wife and all of his wealth, he worked for 20 years. He decided that it's time to go back to, uh, to the land of Israel. And his, father, uh, his father-in-law, Lavan, did not like the idea. And he chased him and threatened to, uh, you know, he came with a whole army, with a whole militia. And uh, Yaakov went with four wives and a bunch of kids. And a bunch of sheep, sheep, you know, the, he, he cattle. He didn't have uh, uh, how to uh, protect himself. Um, but uh, God was fighting for Yaakov, and he came in the middle of the night to Lavan and told him, "You better not touch this man if you want to live one more day or one more hour." Um, so Lavan got scared, and he signed a treaty with Yaakov. And what was the treaty there? Also, an inanimate object that has to be like the contract. They created a monument between themselves. They erected, you know, a, a pile of, of, of stone. Uh, and then this, a gal, you know, a pile of stone. Um, and uh, that monument was the, um, the witness to the, to the um, uh, deal between them, the treaty that no one should cross that line, that monument to attack the other. So that was very nice. Except that they, they never, you know, held their part of the deal. Uh, right after Joshua, Yoshua conquered the land and was, um, you know, basically uh, was ruling us for 28 years. When he, uh, he, when he passed away, the first one that came to attack us, that heard that, oh, now Yoshua is gone, it's a good idea to attack the Jews. Those were the Aramites, Kushan, right? The the the, the same uh, uh, descendant of of Lavan. Uh, he came and he and he enslaved us for eight years, he enslaved us for eight whole years. So they and that happened four hundred years ago. So they 
they uh, basically did not hold their part of the deal uh, long before um, uh, long before David HaMelech came. Uh, but now, what happened now? What happened now is David HaMelech, again, he is one of the best, if not the best politician ever, uh, you know, be, uh, you know, walk the, 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 the face of the earth. Um, and he really analyzed the people and he saw that Aram is an up-and-coming trouble. It's an up-and-coming nation. Aram actually is a group of at least five tribes. Aram Tsova, Aram Damesek, Aram Naraim, Aram Maacha, and Aram something else. Um, five tribes, at least. And they were all uh, from Syria, from Damascus, right? East towards Iraq, deep into Iraq. Aram Naharaim is, is the a nation that was uh, living between, Nahar is a river. Naharaim is two rivers. They were living in between the two rivers, uh, the Euphrates and uh, uh, Chidekel, um, whatever. Prat and Chidekel, the two, the, the, the two rivers. The Tigris. Tigris, Tigris, thank you. The Tigris and the Euphrates, right. So, so, so they were there. And you had a whole bunch of other Aramites uh, that were living over there. And they became very, very strong. So strong, they, 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 they came, really, that was the, the beginning of their ascent was around now. And they were on top of the world for 500 years. And they were the ones that caused the 10 tribes to go away, you know, to, to, they took the tra 10 tribes and they always were... Um, helping our enemies, uh, they're being in the front, or being a sidekick for they were they were terrible. So David Amelech decided to take them when they're young to take them out or to try to weaken them dramatically. And that happened with uh, one of them. It started with one and ended up with more. Vayach David at Hadad Ezer ben Rechov Melech Tzova. Hadad Ezer ben Rechov. This is the king of uh, the the Aramite of Tzova. And what happened with him? What happened with him is Belechtola Shivyado bin Arprat. He was on a quest because he's an up and coming, he felt strong. He was on a quest to expand his borders. And as soon as he crossed the Euphrates, ah, <laughs> the next stop is the Mediterranean, right? That's the next body of water, the, the Jordan River, but you can go around, whatever. But that's the, the next real barrier is, is, is uh, attacking us. So David Amelech saw that he's, um, you know, and it's far away from us, but uh, David Amelech uh, decided that this is, uh, you know, number one, we need to retaliate for, for them not uh, uh, keeping their end of the deal. Number two, to bring some more, uh, you know, funds and, and, and uh, resources for Beta Migdash. And number three, and mainly to really weaken them, hopefully for a long enough time, so they don't, uh, they don't uh, ascend uh, too, too quickly to the top of the world uh, militarily. Uh, so that's what happened over there. Um, now, there is, um, there is a, uh, a story here, a little bit. And um, the point is that um, as we were fighting the war, um, the, the, um, the, there is a law, a Jewish law, that when you start a war, you first have to, um, uh, you know, offer the enemy to capitulate. You know, do you want, do you want to make peace with us and give us what we want? Or so in those discussions, they they. Uh, Took out the uh, you know the, the the papers that they signed and said you have an agreement with us. Well, how can you how can you attack us? So there is so the general who ran that war was Avishai, the brother of Yoav. Uh, he didn't know what to answer them. You're right. So he went back to the Sanhedrin. He went back to David Amelech and asked him, you know, what's going on? So David Amelech is documenting this whole story in Psalms. In chapter 60, Perik Samech. Okay, that's the whole sum about this exact situation. And it starts with, Lam Natseach al Shushan Edut. Okay, it's, it's a song 
Shushan means a rose. Okay? Edut is a testimony. So there is a testimony that despite of the fact that it looks like the things don't match here, they all match like the petals of a rose. Uh, petals of a rose are all organized very nicely to a beautiful flower. This too was very, very beautiful and very, very, you know, organized in the right way. And there are no questions. So because of what we mentioned, the fact that they didn't keep their, you know, deal, etc., etc. Um, so, um, uh, so therefore, uh, David Amelech is, and the whole war, the whole um, Psalm uh, 60 is talking about the fact that he's mentioning those nations uh, and and uh, one of the of the sayings over there about so that he had to go and split and split and break down the monument because one of the things that David had to do right away in order to show his general that he is allowed to fight we have to tear the you know we have to tear the treaty so he went to that uh, monument. Yes, it's today's, right? It's today's uh, first chapter is of today's Tilim is, is uh, 60, right? Um, so uh, he, he had to go find that monument that Jacob and Lavan erected and split it, destroy it, you know, disseminate it, uh, disassemble it. So um, his general will understand now that and will feel and and God will be with him when he when he does that. Now, uh, so that uh, that's that war uh, that happened uh, uh, with with it. So that's war number three. Now, um, we're we're not going to be able to do it now. We'll do it next time. But let's let's talk. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of a taste of what we're going to talk about a lot next time, and that is the the fate. Or the, the 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 rule of law, or, or the the uh, the, the uh, status in Jewish law of those pieces of lands that uh, David Melech conquered. Let me just briefly, and then we'll elaborate next time. Um, there there are obviously uh, uh, two main uh, bodies of law. There is a law that apply in the land of Israel. Everything that grows over there, you have to, to take Trumot and Masrot, right? You have to take tithe, you have to, uh, you have to keep Shemitah. Um, uh, there are, there are many, most, most of the laws of the land, um, uh, you know, apply, or, um, yeah, almost, almost 100% of them apply only in the land of Israel. Uh, and then you have a different body of law, which is more relaxed in, in, in terms of doing, but more strict in terms of not doing in outside of Israel. Outside of Israel, you cannot, you're not allowed to do certain things that you're allowed to do in the land of Israel. Um, and we'll talk about it next time uh, at length. So you have one law for Israel and, another, and uh, you know, for our land and another law outside of Israel, overseas. It doesn't have to be over a sea, but it's just outside of the borders of Israel. And then there is an in-between an in-between uh, uh, state, and that is those pieces of land that David Melech conquered. Why they're a different state? Why are they not like uh, the regular land of Israel? Why are they not like if they're not the land of Israel? Why are they not like you know like uh, you know overseas? Uh, we'll talk about it next time. But this is a it's a big body of law and a big discussions in many tractates in several tractates we we're mentioning it. And uh, there are implications to um, till this very day, basically, um, for, for some of those things. So we'll talk about it next time. In the meantime, just to sort of complete um, at least part of the war, uh, just let's, let's talk about the unpleasant part of it. Um, or oh, not yet. Um, so Vayelkot David Mimeno Elef Ushvamot Parashim. So we are doing the war with uh, the Aramites. Um, David Amelech um, was able to capture uh, 1,700 uh, uh, horse, uh, horses, okay, and, uh, and, and horsemen, Vesrim Elef Ragli, and 20,000 uh, foot soldiers. And Vayaker David et kol arechev, vayater menu mearechev. Now, what happened is that the foot soldiers were protected by the armored, 
vehicles by the chariots and the and the and the horses and the horses that carry that, that that pull the chariots. That's what protected them. That's what gave them the might. You know, the the blitzkrieg of of those days, where with those horses and and, and the chariots, and then the foot soldiers would run after them. Um, so he wanted to eliminate that. Um, stock of, of weapons and he did, so one thing is to take it you know he could have taken all of the horses and bring him to Israel and you know let's now we'll use him but he did not want us to start thinking that oh why are we so strong because of the horses now we're not strong because of the horses we're strong because God is is you know gave us gave his blessing uh, to our existence and he is the one behind our success so he basically made sure that those horses are not fit for war. Uh, some say he killed them. Some say he castrated them. Some say that he shaved their hoofs so they can't really be, you know, they can't really, they can live, but they can't really fight. They can't carry anything. They, you know, so that's what he did uh, to them. And all of the chariots he disassembled and used the raw material, host, you know, brought it over to be used in the building of Bet HaMikdash. Uh, because those chariots were had a very important uh, metal and very you know very uh, a lot of good uh, a lot of good stuff. Um, so he took all the raw material, uh, put took it apart, and um, uh, took it uh, took it into to Yerushalayim uh, to be uh, ready to serve as part of Bet Hamikdash. Except a hundred uh, hundred limousines, you know, a hundred of those chariots he kept in order. To um, to have uh, uh, to show the world that your chariots are now mine. You know he didn't take it all apart. He made sure that uh, he has a hundred of them uh, serving him. And with those hundred in the, the book of Chronicles, uh, it says that with those hundred he also took four hundred um, uh, uh, horses. So. He basically uh, made sure that the horses are, are no longer uh, capable of, of running, most of them except 400 that he needed for those 100 uh, chariots. Um, and, um, and then, let's just do one more. Vatavo um, Aram Damesek, so as we attacked Aram Tsova, one tribe of the Aramites, another uh, one, Aram Damasek, the ones who lived in Damascus, in Syria now, you know, nowadays, the falling apart Syria, um, they came to help Lazor Adad Melech Tzova. So they also got smited. Vayach David Be'aram, Esrimishtayim Elefisha, over there, he struck them down and, and killed uh, 22,000 of those. Um, and then, in order to make sure that there is no dissent and that there is no, uh, uh, nobody ever uh, going to uh, to rise up and, and uh, contemplate, um, uh, you know, uh, organizing, reorganizing themselves. So, Vayasem David Nitzivim Be'aram the Mesek, he put um, captains, he put uh, 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 stations um, uh, with with um, with governors uh, in Damascus and that all area. But he Aram le David Avadim, and they became our slaves, no semincha, who bring us, uh, you know, uh, taxes, vayosha, uh, Hashem et David, bekol asher alach, everything that David did, God made it successful, every single thing, every war, every attack, every attempt, it was all, um, you know, blessed by, uh, by, by, by God, and it was successful accordingly, and uh, next time, we're going to uh, talk a little bit more as we discussed the, uh, uh, the whole halachic status of the land that David Melech conquered in those essential big war years.